Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive, Daniel here. Alright, it's been a little while since I've had a new video up, but we are here today with uh, my first review. I'm calling this my first review and we'll kind of see uh, why a little later of Dungeon Crusade Book 1, Genesis of Evil. Uh, so full caveat, as, as I've mentioned before, Roger and I are online friends. We have talked about possibly working together in the future. Um, so keep that in mind as you watch this review, but also know that I'm not gonna pull any punches. I am a very, very critical gamer, especially when it comes to written documentation. And just like I did with my other friend, Jerry Hawthorne, when I kind of ripped Aftermath a new one for having really poor documentation, I'm going to be critical about Dungeon Crusade as well. That is, just how I do things, and that is what people expect of me. Um, there are a ton of things to love about Dungeon Crusade, and I have grown very fond of this game over the last few weeks that I have been uh, playing it and enjoying it and learning it, but it has also been very frustrating. And I know that a lot of people share that sentiment. I've talked to quite a few people. Um, I think Dungeon Crusade's greatest strengths lie within its layers of simple systems. And the game that I think this is most like is um, Legend, uh, Zaya Legends of the Drift System. Both of these games are greater than the sums of their parts. They are both games that rely on some relatively dated mechanisms like roll to move, um, things like randomness that can completely disrupt your strategy and your tactics, and a lot of uh, little fiddly elements. Now, for viewers of the Dungeon Dive, those are not normally things that we are bothered by but a lot of modern gamers are. These two games are anachronistic in a lot of ways. Um, they are two games that I believe like without Kickstarter, these two games would not exist how they are, uh, especially Dungeon Crusade. Dungeon Crusade is the poster child for what I believe Kickstarter should be used for. It is a passion project by one man or, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a man, but in this case it was by one man who has designed something that was his vision and his vision only. And he wanted to present that vision in as pure a way as possible without interference from other, from developers or from a producer. You know, also similar to Dungeon Universalis. But Dungeon Universalis is a little more of a complex game. So the reason why I think this game is most like Legend or Zaya is because of how it utilizes simple systems and it layers those systems in a way that creates for some really interesting interaction between those systems. And once those systems are learned, it opens up a whole wealth of adventure possibilities. It's like opening a book into a practically limitless fantasy world in which you can get lost for hours and hours and hours. Trust me, you will be lost for hours in this game because it is a very, very long game to get through an entire scenario. Um, but it is fun to get lost in once you get into the game, once you are able to get lost into those systems. And that is unfortunately one of the main issues I have with the game is that it is very hard, at least it was for me and for some people I've been talking to, to get into the game. And that's because of the rule book. That is because of the uh, player's handbook here. I'm gonna have to disrupt my table a little bit. I am in this game, I have set up a scenario from the scenario book, it is uh, taking place in the Ancient Ruins dungeon, and I am playing the Darkness Descending Scenario 2, and I am on quest table 1. 
I have played through a single quest table on all four of the dungeons. Um, I've been wanting to experience the different dungeon boards to see what they have to offer. So I've been jumping around from one dungeon to another rather than completing an entire scenario because you really can play this game in chunks. You can play one scenario table, which is three quests and call it a, a short game, which is still like three hours long. Um, the Crusader's Handbook is frustrating. It is the wordiest um, rule book I've ever read, and it is a very difficult. I found it very difficult to learn the game from this rule book. Um, I know other people have as well. There are a ton of questions on Facebook and a ton of questions on BGG. Um, this is an instance of wordiness adding or creating ambiguity rather than creating clarity. And while you can learn, probably 90% of the rules are actually in here. So, I mean, the rules are in here, most of them. Um, you have to dig through paragraphs and paragraphs of text with tiny little print, multiple columns on a page just to get to the rules. It is written in Roger's conversational style that he makes his videos in. And while that is a great style to present videos, it makes for a very difficult to read and very uh, rule book that is also very hard to learn from. Things that should be simple. This game is not complex. Imagine if Dungeon Crusade or Dungeon, uh, Dungeon Quest, right? Another fantastic game. Imagine if Dungeon Quest Another game that is fantastic because of its simplicity. But imagine if that game had a full-size rulebook that was 40 pages with uh, double columns on each page. That would be, That's overkill, right? Because that game does not need it. This game does not need a 70-page rulebook. If somebody were to create a condensed rulebook for Dungeon Crusade, you could still do it with thematic elements, with art, with picture examples, and probably about 24 pages. Um, one of the areas where people are having some difficulty in is understanding the combat. The combat is actually very simple, but the combat description in the rule book is, I mean, look at this, it's just massive. But when you get to the combat, the combat is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 columns of text and <laughs> examples and pictures of what is a relatively simple system that takes no time at all to learn and no time at all to execute. There's just no reason for that. And so this game really needs a condensed rule book. It needs somebody to go through and strip out all of like the pleasantries and the introductions and the repetition and just present the rules with a little bit of theme to get the point across quicker. It's very frustrating to sit and read this rule book for the first time. It took me about four hours to get through. I mean, it is long and laborious and I grew in, impatient and I really wanted to play the game and I was having a really hard time learning the game. The first week, it was very frustrating. I actually boxed up the game and got something else out. I got Adventure Tactics out because I was like banging my head against the wall. I knew I would love this game because I've been you know, watching his, uh, Roger's videos and I love the look. I knew that a good game was here. I just was not finding it in this book. Every time I had a question while I was playing, I would it would just totally depress me because I knew I would have to search through this rule book for, you know, multiple minutes, 5, 10, 15 minutes, finding the rule within these huge paragraphs. You know, even though there is a table of contents and, to, and, and an introduction, once you get to the section you need to look at, you have to wade through words upon words upon words just to find a little detail buried in there. I mean, the wordiness is like, it's like H.P. Lovecraft times Algernon Blackwood plus Clark Ashton Smith levels of wordiness. And 
that kind of presentation, while I think works in a video with Roger's talking style and his that style of communication, for me and for many others, it just does not work in this book. I have talked to multiple people over the last few weeks who have said they are boxing up the game and putting on putting it on the shelf until somebody makes a condensed rule book. Um, and that is a real shame because had this game come with like this handbook that was written in Roger's voice, the voice that he wants to convey the information in, with an additional condensed rule summary for people just to learn the game and look up answers to questions while they are playing the, while they are playing the game, uh, Dungeon Crusade would have hit the table as an instant freaking classic dungeon crawl game because there is so much to love in this game. Like so much to love, but it just is a real uphill battle to get there. Um, a few other little things that I think, uh, I, I wonder how much this game was play tested by people who were not Roger or play tested with people without Roger. I don't believe there are any play testers listed in the rule book, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure if any blind play testing was done, but there are a few things that lead me to believe that probably not a lot was done. Uh, one thing is, so if you, uh, the game comes with two dungeons, uh, this side, the ancient ruins, on the other side is the tomb of Kaladar, and then if you buy the expansion, you get another double-sided dungeon. Nowhere in the rule book or the scenario book does are there pictures of which dungeon is which. So if you weren't paying attention to videos and like the development of the game while it was going on, you would not know that this is in fact the ancient ruins. You would not know that on the other side is the tomb of Kaladar. You would not know that Castle Blackwood is Castle Blackwood. Um, and that's crazy. You know, this game should have had, the rules should have had a full spread splash page of each dungeon set up with its name and then showing some highlights about where certain things are. Uh, another issue is in a, there is a discrepancy between the iconography used. So on the um, monsters here, they're all gonna have three different combat icons that they're going to fight with. And the combat icons don't actually like match up with the icons on the little combat tokens. Some of them look similar, but some of them look quite different. Um, that's especially true with the um, physical combat here. Like this sword here looks absolutely nothing like the token. So I'm really wondering why that was. I mean, you know, consistency between iconography is a super important element in board games. And so that is something that I would address by you know, when the next printing comes out is just change these icons to match what is actually printed on the, um, the cards. And I think that is, oh, one other thing, one other, one other criticism I had, we're almost to the good stuff, guys. Like I said, this is an uphill battle, so you guys are gonna have to go uphill with me until we get to the good stuff. It's worth doing. Um, there will be icons on the map that tell you to put uh, tokens. So for instance, this little treasure chest, when you are seeding the dungeon, you are going to put a treasure chest there. On some of the dungeons, those icons are on top of other icons. And these red arrows are a crucial element to the game when a minion becomes a raiding minion and it wants to leave the dungeon to raid the village. There are certain um, maps where you put treasure chests over those other icons when there are plenty of empty squares around. So I'm really wondering why that wasn't just moved over one or moved over in that direction. The same up here is like, there's a treasure uh, icon here right by this door. And if you put the chit there, it hangs off the edge. So like, why wasn't that just put over to the uh, side there? So just some really like, I know that's like nitpicky, but those are the kinds of things that uh, blind play testers would have uh, noticed and could have mentioned like, hey, let's just move this treasure chest one square over so it's not blocking another critical element on the map. And now I think we have crested the hill. 
I think we have worked our way up the hill, taking a week or so to read the, the handbook, getting all of your ambiguities cleared up by Roger on Facebook or other people on uh, message boards. And unfortunately, you know, really a, a game that's been in development for five plus years really shouldn't need um, the community to step up to answer questions. But um, that is it. And hopefully some you know, very nice uh, saint on, <laughs> on BGG creates that condensed rule book that so many of us are needing for this game so we can hit the table with the game in the best possible state it is in. And, um, but yes, we have crested the hill, we have gone through our uphill, and um, we are now to the good stuff. So first of all, I, I have done more work to get this game playable on my small table than any game I ever have played. If I was not enjoying this game as much as I am, I would not have done as much work as I needed to do just to be able to physically play this game. I had to come up with creative solutions to store the cards. You know, you have these mining decks. So these are gonna be decks that of uh, cards that you are going to uh, use pickaxes to mine gems, to make power gems, to uh, boost your weapons and armor. There are four of those, so I double stacked those, A, B, C, and D. I uh, stacked my loot deck in a certain way, my blacksmith deck I stacked in a certain way. I have uh, these power gems and my pick axes double stacked. I have my secret rooms and my traps double stacked. I have my celebration day and my special abilities double stacked. I keep all of my minions um, stacked up, levels one through four in one stack. I keep my champions in one stack. I have this is like my little quest table area, my treasure chest and my encounter cards. We're moving over to my dice area. I had to make this um, initiative sheet to keep track of the initiative tokens. So when you're planning out your move, normally you're going to want to, uh, you would keep those on your hero cards, but I don't have enough room to keep the hero cards set up because this game is absolutely massive and my room is tiny as is my table. So I made this initiative track here where I can keep track of the initiative. I can put my potions that my heroes have. I can put their torches. I can keep track of their money. Then over here we have where we have our environment cards. If there's an environment out, we have our minion track where we're keeping track of our different minions and guardians and the different denizens of the uh, dungeon that we're going to be fighting. Then the main thing I did over here is my one side table. I was able to create this hero book where over here I have all of my heroes. I have their health and their essence and any notes so I can keep track of any afflictions that they are suffering from. I can keep track here of how many health elixir, ocher, and torches that I have used because in each scenario there is only a certain number available as you go in. Here we have our heroes. So my hero has, I have my hero sheet there. I have their abilities down in this pocket. The second page for each hero has their gear, so weapons, um, armor, you know, helmets, uh, trinkets, whatever, rings. I can keep track of their afflictions by putting their cards in there, but she has been healed of her poison. So we have Mahiliac there with his gear. We have Faith there with her gear. We have Zeke with his gear. Palom, Palom. Uh, the thief, I am really liking her uh, rogue. She's been kind of my VIP in this scenario. And then Sir Brennus. Sir Brennus found this awesome fabled charm that he can use when he levels up to level three. And he was poisoned, but he is now cured of his poison. And then I made, so this game comes with, if you look at the unboxing videos and my, my initial videos, comes with these giant sideboards for your dungeon UI and your village UI. And I made the dungeon UI, I made it very small so I can keep track of all the things I need to um, and keep it in this one pocket in this folder. And I made the village board tiny also so I can keep that 
there. On top of that, there are a number of different uh, cheat sheets that I have made and also copied from BGG. I have a combat cheat sheet that helps. I have a, up a, the five phases of the game and then an advanced and basic uh, setup cheat sheet that helps in setting everything up. So I have done a lot of work to make this game playable and I am really glad that I have because it is more than worth it. So let's talk about the good stuff. First thing is the look. This game looks freaking amazing. I mean, just look at that dungeon board. And this is just one. I wish I had room to show you the others, but I'd have to like disrupt this game. And I'm, I'm actually really loving this, this scenario I'm playing right now. Um, this is the Ancient Ruins. I mean, just those colors just pop. The dungeon, uh, the corridors and the rooms are interesting. There are things to look at. There are things that make me want to create my own scenarios and i've noticed that on every single dungeon board i'm like ooh, this would be a cool idea this would be cool and i'm really looking forward to doing that the art on the um, minions and the guardians and the champions is all really good all kinds of interesting creatures to fight and great colors great design i think the cards look good they do have kind of an old school like 90s vibe to them like old magic cards with their borders you know a lot of card a lot of games these days they don't have borders everything goes uh, bleeds right to the edge that's kind of like the new design style but this game everything went back to more of an old school look uh, the loot cards have all kinds of great art. They have a little, little tiny piece of lore at the bottom that you can read that adds a little bit of flavor. And th just the abundance of art in this game is, 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 it's just off the charts how much good art is in this game. My favorite art are the trap cards. I'm not playing with the traps right now because I'm finding the game difficult enough right now without adding the traps to it. But this, uh, these black and white line drawings for the traps are just amazing. So this game is, is absolutely gorgeous. I love just setting this game up and looking at it. It makes me excited to play it as I am looking at the dungeon and just kind of imagining the adventures I'm going to be uh, going on. Another great thing about this game is the Avalon Adventure board game, the game you play before the game, like in my uh, that video I did called Yo Dog, I Heard You Like Games, so here's a game to play before you play a game. Um, the Avalon Adventure board game is, I did uh, my first video, so you can go back and watch that. I took a look at that. Um, a lot of games these days, especially Kickstarter games, are coming with lore books, books about the world that the game takes place in. Well, the coolest thing about the Avalon Adventure board game is it is an interactive book of lore. It's like a little choose your own adventure board game where you get to move around this map and the map is uh, as similar to the map that you can see here on the scenario book. You get to move around from region to region and there's a huge stack of, of adventure cards and you just have really simple choose your own adventure, dice chucking adventures but while you are doing it, you are learning about the world. You are learning about factions. You are learning about environments. You are learning about uh, different characters. So it's an interactive book of lore. That is super cool. Um, when you get to the game itself, I think the coolest thing is the patrol route system. Now the patrol route system are these color little footprints and these nodes where the enemies are going to stop or the enemies are going to spawn on certain numbers of these nodes. And we have one through eight and eight ends over here. When a minion comes out, they're going to spawn on one of those numbers. And then they will sometimes hit these little bone piles, which are nodes. And then you are going to roll the patrol route uh, D8. And then they will move along that, um, that patrol route, that color, a certain number of spaces. And that is really interesting, especially when you couple it with the way the guardians move. So the guardians, they move along colored patrol routes as well. The guardians are like the big bosses, but they move 
from quadrant to quadrant. They don't move space to space, so they move like they are just trucking through the dungeon. They are on a war path to get to your heroes and to destroy them. But what ends up happening is when you couple that, the way the enemies move, um, a lot of times in dungeon crawls, you have your heroes on the map, they move around, then some enemies come on the map, your heroes and your enemies, they move towards each other, they fight, you know, the heroes beat the enemies, the enemies are cleared off the map, rinse and repeat. There isn't this feeling of the dungeon existing outside of the areas where the heroes happen to be. But in this game, you've got monsters will be milling around and up here in this quadrant. Maybe one will kind of trickle down into another area. You might have a little pocket of activity here. And what the patrol route system does is it creates these little pockets of interest, these pockets of activity that you can kind of watch and monitor and make a plan to go in. You can make a plan to kind of like, okay, I'm going to come around this corridor here, but I don't want to cross this wall because I, I don't want to come into line of sight of an enemy. You know, I want to stay a little sneaky. Um, hopefully that enemy over there continues to travel along the blue path so I can come in over here and like kind of maybe clean up this treasure chest. It really makes for this um, interesting notion of the dungeon being this kind of like a living world. And it's very simple. Again, this is a simple system, a couple simple systems that are layered on top of each other to create interesting interactions. And that is what this game is really, really good at. Um, the, another thing that this game has going for it are the encounter cards. Now, the encounter cards, I believe there is about 80 of them. And you're going to play with, I believe it's uh, 30, 30 or 40. I can't remember if it's 30 plus 10. There are a few called interludes, which are like nothing happens. Just, uh, you know, it, it, it's a time for the uh, heroes to catch their breath. But you're going to be playing, and there are a ton of these, and they are all really interesting. You're going to draw one on each turn, and they will have different events, some good, some bad. Some will spawn monsters. Some you will have to take challenges to do stat tests. Um, some will have environmental effects that stay in place um, until a new environment comes out to take its place. You can get healed. You can get damaged. You can find... Uh, loot. There's all kinds of really cool things that happen and every single card is different except for those 10 interlude cards and it is always fun to draw one. I'm always surprised and it's always a, uh, a neat thing. The other thing that is really cool about this game is the treasure chest deck. This is one of the most fun treasure chest decks I've ever seen in a game. There are uh, there are monsters that you can get uh, ambushed by. There's all kinds of great loot. Uh, there are, you know, you can draw random loot. Some of the uh, treasure chest items are special loot. Like I have this one uh, Dawn Star. What is it? It is the, um, it's in my here. Palom has it. This Dawn Star Stone, which allows her to uh, teleport anywhere in the dungeon once per quest table. So that was really cool, very useful and neat item. But drawing a treasure chest uh, card from here, it's always a fun time. Tons of great art. You never know what you're gonna get. I have been pretty lucky in this game because I have found a ton of gold and good things. Um, so far I've found 2,000 gold, 500 gold, 1,000 gold, 700 gold, 1,500 gold, and empty. So I've been really lucky in this game so far. I've amassed quite a bit of gold. So I'm looking forward to finishing up these quests and going back to the, um, going back to the village and shopping. Another really cool thing is during the upkeep phase is when you get to plan out your hero's turns. And this is a very different element about this game that I have not seen in any other dungeon crawl. It's not a programming, you're not programming like Robo Rally, but you are assigning uh, from one to six, you are assigning an, an initiative number to a certain hero. And you want to group your heroes kind of like in little parties because they can work together to take down stronger enemies. They can work together to overcome challenges and that kind of thing. 
So you want to think about how you are breaking up your party into smaller parties. You want to think about how the different heroes, how they complement each other, how they might have different strengths and weaknesses. And then you assign your initiative uh, number to each hero. And then during the hero phase, the heroes act in that initiative order. And that, again, is another very simple system that is layered upon that patrol route system for the guardians and for the minions and it just creates for some really memorable moments in these pockets of activity that are happening around the dungeon and so many times you may have you know uh, you have a perfect plan but you know the, the the god of the dungeon throws a huge bladed monkey wrench into your plans and you have to think on the fly and you have to adapt on the fly and while some people may not like that element of randomness coming and ruining your perfectly laid plan for me it just it adds this sense of uh this sense of chaos and this sense of uh of chance and adventure to the planning stage now normally i don't like playing these kinds of games with more than two heroes but once again there is a simplicity layer over everything in this game the heroes are very simple to play Playing all six heroes in Dungeon Crusade feels like maybe playing two heroes in Folklore. Very little bookkeeping. It's not hard. The, the hardest thing is just having the space to do it in, which is why I had to make my little character book over there. But um, I actually really enjoy playing this game with six heroes. I would not want to play with fewer, even though you can. You can change the difficulty a little bit. And that is another simple system that this game has, is this uh, difficulty layer. The way that you can change the difficulty on the scenarios. The scenario will have all these different difficulty tables, and you can select anything from novice to master. And you can make the game as hard or as easy as you want, mixing and matching different elements to uh, make the perfect game for you. Now, I know some people think that like that should be up to the designer to balance the game in that way. And while I can see that point of view in this game, I think it works. It's, it's a plus in Dungeon Crusade. And then, um, yeah, so we've looked at the loot deck. The, the loot deck, again, tons of loot. There are like almost 200 pieces of loot. They are very simple. They're not going to add a whole bunch of... Um, different things you have to keep track of. But as you start getting more and more loot, you can start really building out your characters in interesting ways. And again, it's a simple system that when you add it to the other simple systems, it makes for some interesting combinations and some interesting uh, layers. One thing that I am a little disappointed in are the character special abilities. Um, in my opinion, they are a little boring, and Roger wanted to keep it simple, so I respect that because i that's kind of the theme of this review is that layers of simple systems working together, but I would have appreciated if these were a little more interesting because you will have a couple different special abilities available to each hero while you are playing, and they go from level one to level three. And all they do, the only difference is really is like in a, in a number. So like level one, holy damage. Holy damage may be activated. It deals one damage to the target monster. Level two deals two damage to the, market, to the targeted monster. Level three does three damage. So they're just, in my opinion, they are a little boring. It would be cool if they added just a little bit more interesting things that would make it more fun to level up your heroes. But that is probably my only criticism of the heroes and the different ways that you can um, level them up. But um, yeah, so the way all of those things work together really makes this game feel different as you are exploring the quests and completing your objectives, you know, you're going to be moving around the dungeon and you're gonna be going into different chambers to see what lies within, trying to get your different quest items. Uh, sometimes you're gonna to have to kill monsters to uh, complete different quests. And while you are planning your move, the, uh, the, the minions and the guardians are moving on their own with this, 
you know, this simple AI system where you don't need to really make decisions for them. The monsters are kind of pre-programmed to do their own thing. And so you are able to free up that part of your brain to just enjoy the adventure. And this game has a ton of adventure to offer. So much. There is so much in this game that is good. It is just a real shame that I think these layers of simple systems were betrayed by an overly wordy rule book that makes learning the systems one, not fun, two, more difficult than it needs to be, and three, it makes it for when you have to look up an answer to a question while you're playing really, really frustrating. So what I suggest you do is you know, read the book, play a game, kind of stumble your way through. Don't worry too much about your questions while you're playing. Play consistently. You know, if you do something wrong, do it wrong consistently, but then go back and read the book and jot down your, 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 your questions, read the book again, and then start taking some notes so you can learn the game. Um, because once you really get into it, once you learn the systems, and once you no longer have to look at the overly wordy, cumbersome rule book, you will be flying through the turns of this game just having an absolute blast. Things move quickly in this game. The rule book while you're reading it, it makes it sound like things are like really difficult and really slow and really cumbersome, but they're not. It's just the way that the rules are written that make it seem that way. So yeah, this is a great game. This is a super cool dungeon crawl. It just has a few little things that need work. And I know Roger is not abandoning the game, quite the opposite. He has expansions in the works. Um, hopefully, you know, I, I think he was getting a little frustrated with some people who were complaining about the rule book because this is his baby, you know, and I get it. When I release an album and people criticize it, it hurts my feelings. But you know what? That happens when you release something um, that is your creative vision. You're gonna have to deal with some criticism. And there are people like me who are super critical about things. And I'm hoping that Roger can take my criticism and other people's criticism to heart, you know, work on a condensed rule book, release it alongside this Crusader handbook. So you have the best of both worlds. You have the book that has the verbose, you know, Roger style writing and conversational tone where he over explains everything, but also have a nice little condensed 10, 12, 20 page rule book that is just the rules and just ways to answer questions while you are playing in a concise manner. And if those things happen, if those little um, criticisms I have get ironed out and a new edition of the game or some supplements get released, uh, you are going to be hitting this game. This game's going to be hitting your table and it's going to just pop and you are going to have a great time plan for a long time because this is a long game even though you can get moving through things pretty quickly there is still a lot to go through i imagine that even once you get really working with the game system and learning it you're still going to be looking at probably a four to eight hour experience you know this is an all day like super epic dungeon crawling experience has a ton to offer but it is a frustrating uphill battle to get to that point so uh you will be seeing more of dungeon crusade from the dungeon dive that is a guaranteed fact <laughs> right there so all right guys well i hope you enjoyed this uh look at dungeon crusade i hope you are enjoying the game i hope you're not getting too frustrated with the rules and I hope you are uh, learning how to appreciate and how to love what this game has to offer. So we will talk to you guys later. Take it easy. Bye-bye.